All right. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to uh, another Sunday morning version of Jesus and Jeans. We're glad to have you here with us today. Uh, we're Jan and I are really excited. We get to have our granddaughter Kate here with us. Her parents are out of the actually on a trip, and yeah, her hand. Hey, Kate. She's seven. Yeah. Going on twenty-one. <laughs> These kids, boy, they're brilliant these days, huh? They amaze me. That's great, though. She pulls our average down. That's exactly <laughs> what I tell you. That's, not, that's a short trip for me, buddy. Her parents are doing wine tasting right yeah. in Europe. Yeah, yeah well, tough life. <laughs> we uh, want to spend some time. I want to do things a little different this morning. Uh, first of all, not only want to welcome you all here, but want to welcome all of our friends that are joining us uh, via the internet. We do streaming of our service every week. And so if you're watching us uh, today uh, on the computer, we want to thank you uh, for joining us and uh, being part of our worship. Uh, today I, I want to start off uh, just by praying for uh, a friend of mine, a gentleman by the name of Greg Crook. And uh, Greg has, has been diagnosed with bone cancer, and uh, he was a great friend of mine. He used to uh, be one of the musicians that worked with me back in the, in the day when I was in the recording industry, and um, he was a steel guitar player and just an incredible musician. It was really, really great. Uh, but uh, hospice has been called in to his home, and uh, thank God he's able to, to be at home. Uh, but for the last couple of weeks, I meant to pray for him last week, and I'm 64, did I tell you that? And so I, I totally spaced that. And so today I want to just say, Greg, if you're watching, I want you to know how much I love you and uh, how much we're going to pray for you, uh, for God's healing uh, uh, for your life and for your body. And um, so let, let's just go together today. We're going to be... Uh, we're going to be looking at First Peter today, and we're just going to start off with some teaching, but I want us to start off by praying for my friend Greg. Father, uh, we do come before you to say, Lord, we thank you for all that you do in our life. Father, I come especially to lift up my friend Greg today. God, I, I pray that as the great physician that you would reach down and bring a healing touch to his body. Father, we know that you... Your desire is to heal us, whether you heal us perfectly when we're home with you or you heal us, Father, as a testimony to your love and your power and your grace. And, and we get to stay here. But God, I don't mind saying I'm a selfish lot and I'd like to ask you to, to bring healing to my brother Greg, that he might be able to live out his days here on this earth and that it would be a blessing and a testimony to his family. Father, we love you. We ask your blessings also today on our service. Father, as we talk about developing a, a genuine faith and a glorious love, as we look at the words of Peter as he speaks to our hearts, I, I pray, Father, that you will open up the word in a very real and a very relevant way, that we might be able to apply these truths to our lives and to live purpose-filled lives. We love you, Lord. Thank you so much for loving us. We ask your blessings today in the powerful name of your Son, Jesus. And all God's children said, Amen. 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 Well, for the next few weeks, I want to do uh, what I call some spiritual profiling. And uh, I want to use three of the disciples who, who actually became the leaders of the early church in the early days of Christianity. Peter, along with James and John, outside of Jesus, who is the centerpiece, the cornerstone of all Scripture, along with also the, the Apostle Paul, were the patriarchs of, and the fathers of our faith. A lot of their teachings, a lot of their writings have formed our doctrine, have formed the way we do worship. And they form the way that we live out this life as Christ followers. Peter obviously was one of the twelve disciples. He was prominent among the twelve disciples. He was one of the chosen three that got to spend a lot of time with Jesus. A lot of personal time. 
So Jesus would spend time with the crowds like we're doing here today. And then Jesus would spend a lot of time with the twelve. The twelve disciples. But then Jesus spent even more time with three men. Peter, James, and John. And that really is a good structure of leadership. If you're in any type of leadership position, especially if you're dealing with the public in any way, is that we always deal with the public. We always have the larger crowds that we deal with. But then there is a, a special group of people, whether it be your employees or your managers, that kind of thing that you spend a lot of time with. But every good leader makes it a point to spend time with a smaller group of people. Those are the, the people that you do life with. And uh, I try to have that in my life. I, I have three men as well as their wives that I, I look toward for advice, for input. I give them permission to look into my life to say, is you know anything going wrong? Are you on the right track? And I think any good leader surrounds himself with people, not yes people, but people who are willing and open and honest enough to be able to look into our lives and say, you know, speak truth. If all you do is surround yourself with yes people, you're not going to go very far as a leader. And, and one thing that really determines a leader is when people are actually following you. Peter Drucker, a great businessman, says if you if one of, of the determinations of a leader that people are actually following you. If you if you call yourself a leader and you turn around and there's no one following you, then you're just out for a long walk. And so Peter was one of these guys, Peter, James, and John. Peter was part of those very intimate conversations with Jesus. He was there with, when Jesus was transfigured. When literally the voice of God spoke to Jesus and these three men heard the voice of God. And Peter was the one that put his foot in his mouth during that time and wanted to build an altar. He said, Lord, let's just build an altar and just... Let's just hang out here for a while. Basically, Jesus said, be quiet. Stop talking, Peter. It's my father talking. Peter was the one that denied Christ. If you remember, Peter was the one who boastfully said, I will never abandon you. Everybody else might leave you, but I will never abandon you. And of course, he was the first one to run off and, and leave. I think Peter is one of the guys in the scriptures that, that I can most relate to. I want to share, before we get into 1 Peter, uh, this a passage in Matthew 16. First part of this story is really epic. Peter hits a home run by identifying Jesus as the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus replied in verse 17, he says, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by man, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. Think about Jesus saying that to your face. And then he says, I will give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. And whatever you bind on earth will be, will be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. That's a powerful thing that Jesus said to Peter. You are Peter. Petra, the rock. He says, I'm going to build my church on this revelation on you, that this revelation that God the Father has given, given you about who I am, I'm going to build on that because it was revealed to you. And the gates of hell will not overcome it. 
But then, check out what happened about four verses later. <laughs> Jesus turns to Peter in verse 23 and he says to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. You did not have in mind the things of God, but the things of men. Now, how in four verses do you go from being the rock to being Satan? From being a hero to zero in one fell swoop. This is why I can really relate to Peter. I feel like sometimes that I can really hit a home run for God. Do exactly what God's calling me to do. And a few minutes later, blow it all. Have you ever had days like that? Yeah. Where you just woke up and you feel like, man, I could charge hell with a water pistol. Right. <laughs> And five minutes later, you feel like, you know, the slime of the earth. I've had more days like that than I can count. And this is why I can relate to this guy. Peter could not get it right for a long period of time. But he tried. I mean, he tried so hard to get it right. But Peter was always putting his foot in his mouth. That's why my mouth is so big. I wear a 10 and a half, but 11 feels so good, I always buy a 12. Just so, just say it. Now, 1 Peter, just to give you a little background about 1 Peter. Peter was, 1 Peter was probably written around A.D. 64. And so by the time Peter writes 1 Peter, he's not the young, immature, hothead guy anymore. Peter now is an old man. And Peter is very close to being crucified, killed, martyred for the sake of Christ. And now he's probably in his 60s. I don't know if he's 64 or not. <laughs> he's in his 60s. He and I were like that. He's more mature. He's mellowed out quite a bit. And he writes these two letters, 1st and 2nd Peter, that are later distributed throughout lots of churches. And so a lot of the churches open these letters and they read them out loud. And they read them in front of all the people, just like we're going to do today. And then they discuss what they had just read. Now we're going to read verses 3 through 25. And we're going to go through them uh, almost uh, expository type of teaching today. The opening scripture is, is actually what they call a doxology. It's important because Peter is giving praise to God. Peter does not give a lot of commands in this first part of the letter. And what I believe Peter is saying to all of us and to the people who read this letter, he was saying, would you allow your imagination to come alive once again. One of the things that I personally want to see happen here at Jesus and James is for us to never get over the, the mysterious nature of God. The mysterious nature of God for us. When we come here to worship, I don't want it to be just rote. I don't want it to be just routine. You may have noticed we didn't start off with music today. <laughs> My prayer is for us that when we come to worship, that we come to explore this mysterious and fascinating God that we serve. And not come here to worship like 
we've got all our theology figured out. Like, we understand all there is to know about God because we don't. In 20, over 20 years of studying the Bible, I, have, I, I can promise you, I've barely scratched the surface of understanding, truly understanding God's Word as it applies to my life and certainly as it applies to yours. And so, in these opening verses, the first point that Peter's saying to us is that he's saying, I think it's important how you live your life. And I think he lived enough of life with all the different parts of his personality because he was a very spontaneous type of person. Remember when he was with Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane and they came to arrest Jesus, it was Peter who grabbed the sword and cut off the ear of the soldier. So he was, had a lot of spontaneity. He said a lot of things off the cuff and he, he had an arrogance about him. But that same, those same qualities and characteristics also drove the passion of who he was as an, as an apostle, as a leader in the church. And I think after all of these years and now more mature, now further down the road in his faith, he's saying, I think it's important how you live your life. And so that's going to be the focal point of, of each point that we discuss today. And I, I think the first thing that Peter would say to us is that live your life with a sense of wonder. He's saying, listen, live your life with a sense of wonder and don't lose your marvel. <coughs> that's marvel, not marbles. <laughs> <laughs> He talks about the eternity that we're about to experience together in heaven. And in verse 3, he says this. <clears throat> now, I'm reading out of the NIV today. I, I took the liberty of putting it on my pad because these little letters in here are getting hard for me to see. <laughs> and he says in verse 3, in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3, Praise be to God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In His great mercy, He has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade, kept in heaven for you. Now just think about that. That through our relationship with Jesus Christ, because we've ask the Lord to come into our hearts and our lives to be the Savior and the Lord of our life. Peter says that we've been given a new birth into a living hope. You see the difference? There's a big difference in just hope and living hope. We have a living hope because God our Father and His Son has made a way for us to spend eternity with Him. And that is our living hope that we live out of each and every day of our lives. And it's not just going to heaven. It's an inheritance. Christ has brought us, that living hope has brought us into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. And Peter is saying this inheritance is kept in heaven for each one of us. That's powerful. Verse 5 says, Who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the, in the last time. In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief and all kinds of trials. These have come, these, the trials, the grief, these have come so that your faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes, even though refined by fire, may be proved genuine 
and may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Though you have not seen Him. I love this. I want to stop right there for a second. I want you to understand what Peter is saying. Peter is saying, I saw Him. I saw Him. I saw the holes in His hands and His feet. I saw Him after He was resurrected. I saw Him, I talked with Him, I walked with Him. I heard the parables. I was there when He fed 5,000 people. I was there when He fed the other 4,000. I was there when He opened up blinded eyes. I was there when He raised the sun back from the dead for the widow. I was there, and so it should be easy for me I was there. But he's actually giving us a compliment. He's saying, listen, you've not seen any of these. You weren't there, but yet you believe. This, this was a marvelous thing to Peter as he was writing this letter to all of the churches to all of the believers who had come after Jesus had gone back to heaven. And he goes on in the scriptures and he says, the angels in heaven marvel at us today. That's the truth. We've never seen Jesus. We've never had a conversation with Him. We've never seen Jesus do miracles like He did. And yet, we believe. Yet we trust. Yet our hope is in Him. And the angels in heaven marvel at us. They're saying, how, how can they believe in these people of such faith when they never saw Him? It's faith. Our faith amazes the people in heaven. And then he says, though you have not seen Him, you love Him. And even though you do not see Him now, you believe in Him, are filled. You're filled. That word filled in the Greek means to overflowing abundance. It's not like a little splash of water that gets on you. He's talking about being filled Consumed, saturated, overflowing with this inexpressible joy that you cannot even explain or express to people. You're filled with this inexpressible joy. And he says, for you are receiving the goal of your faith, the salvation of your souls. That's why I want to talk to you this morning about a, ha, developing a genuine faith and a glorious joy. The fact that we're gathered together and having fun and laughing and, and feel like God's breathing on us. And there's joy in this place each and every Sunday that we show up. This is a miracle. It, it's fascinating for me to watch what God's doing here. And Jan and I are really thrilled to be part of it. I can remember not so long ago feeling burned out, feeling worn out on religion. And I shut down. I didn't want to ever go back into what I'm doing now for anything in this world. Not because I didn't love Jesus. I love Jesus. I didn't love His children anymore. And for years, I put on my best face. I stayed on staff at a church. I became the poser. 
And I always said, when anybody, Teddy, how you doing? I'm fine. I'm fine. I'm really fine. But I what? How about you? Do you ever feel like that? Do you ever get burned out? Just worn out with religion? I was kind of chuckling this morning. I'm always amazed what churches put on their little signs out front. <laughs> and I'm, I'm thinking, where do you find this stuff? Yeah. Yeah, me too. <laughs> but I saw one coming up the road this morning says, too blessed to be depressed. <laughs> I'm too blessed to be depressed. Well, what does that say if you're dealing with depression? There must be something wrong with me. Because everybody else, all these people here, are too blessed to be depressed, but I'm depressed. Now, I think if... if they probably don't have room to put it on their sign, but I get what they're saying. I'm too blessed by the Lord to allow depression first place in my life. That I can deal with. Because I get depressed. And I either, I tell y'all all the time, I'm either up or getting up. I'm, I'm never down. You know, I'm never down emotionally to where I can't get back up. But I'm either up or getting up. If I'm telling you I'm getting up, that means at some point I was down. Does that make sense? And to me, that's, that's the reality. You know, it's not like we're walking around like Stepford people and they just wind us up and there goes one of those Christian guys and girls. <laughs> Amen. Glory. Hallelujah. I'm too blessed to be depressed. <laughs> How's that working for you? Because I'm depressed. I deal with stuff all the time. But... Thanks be to God that I have some place to go to deal with that. That I have the Lord Jesus, I have the Holy Spirit alive in me that says, Ted, this way. Thank you, God. Maybe there's some of you that that maybe you, you've had that period where you've shut down inside. You're, you're just walking it out right now. Maybe you're, you're not really feeling anything. You put on a good face maybe. Maybe you're posing just a little bit. And it's not that you're a liar or fake. I want you to hear me when I say, I know what that feels like been there done that but look at what he put, Peter says in verse 4 he says I'm going to call you into an inheritance that can never perish fall or fade I'm calling you Teddy into an inheritance that can never perish spoil or fade and that kind of knowledge that understanding makes me want to live with a sense of wonder because of what God has done for me. For what God has done for us through His Son, Jesus. The second point I think that Peter would make in our lives in developing a genuine faith and a glorious love is that to live your life like heaven is your home. One of the ways that you can get your joy back is to live for heaven and, and not to live just on this earth. Now, hear me when I say, I have met some people that they are, they're so heavenly minded that they're no earthly good. You know what I'm saying? And, and again, it's that, you know, I'm, I'm always focused, well, you know, one of these days, and, and that's true. One of these days, we're going to step into eternity. And I used to do funerals for a funeral home uh, in South Carolina. And for over 10 years, I was their pastor on call. And I used to do, you know, uh, services for people that didn't go to church or didn't know the Lord or any, any of that kind of stuff. And I used to tell them, you know, one of these days they're going to have a service like this for me. 
And the pastor's going to stand up and he's going to say a few words, you know, over my grave. And then if I know my family, they're going to go to, back to my house, eat potato salad, and divide up my stuff. <laughs> Now, that's a reality. I'm not being mean. <laughs> and Peter says, but, you know, live your life like heaven is your home. The reality is, is that the earth is going to pass away. Everything that we see will pass away. And, and God's going to send a new heaven and a new earth. And that's our future. That is our eternity. And the second step for getting your joy back is get your eyes off the ground. Lift up your head and, and see what God has already kept in heaven for us. It's an inheritance. And literally the word inheritance means that it's already been legally established by God through our faith in Jesus Christ. It's an irreparable trust that cannot be broken. It gives us hope. The Bible says to think about the people that are in heaven because it would give us hope. And, and I'm fine with that. But let me ask you, how often do you think of yourself in heaven? How often do you imagine what it's going to be like? Are you even fascinated by it? I'm fascinated by it. Because the Bible talks about heaven a lot. <laughs> Peter talked about it right here in, in this first chapter. And I think when you begin to take some time and every day and just say, Lord, I'm just looking forward to heaven. I don't think that it's the consolation prize. I think it, it's the prize. That it's there for us to spend time for eternity with God Himself. How cool is that? One of the things that's definitely going to be in heaven is worship. We're not going to be evangelizing anymore. We're not going to be doing mission work. We're going to be worshiping God the Father. We're going to have time to sit down with Jesus and say, can I ask you a few questions? I think we got time. <laughs> and we're going to be able to do that. It's fascinating. And, and when you start just taking some moments during your day and just say, Lord, thank you for my inheritance. Thank you, Lord, that this is not all that there is. Thank you, Lord, that I'm just a pilgrim in this place. That I'm just journeying through. It's powerful. This is not my final destination. Earth is not my home. I have an assignment here. I have something to do here. You see, I want to be productive on the earth because I've been proclaimed in heaven. I want to do what God's called me to do on the earth. I don't want to miss out on any opportunities that God may provide for me here on this earth. But Lord, I am very grateful that I have an inheritance and that heaven is my home. And that each and every day I'm walking toward home. Each and every day is a step toward home. I don't know how many more steps I've got. Hopefully several thousand. <laughs> Even a million. <laughs> but every day is a step toward the house. Every day is a step toward home. And when you live like heaven is your home, you'll start getting a little bit of that joy back. As Christ followers... We have something to look forward to. Heaven. Never going to perish. Never going to spoil. Never going to fade. It's powerful. 
The third step is, that Peter would say is to live your life having genuine faith. In verse 6 it says, You may have to suffer grief and all kinds of trials. Well, that's encouraging. <laughs> you may have to suffer grief and all kinds of trials. And i got to tell you, I really don't want to be a whiny guy. You ever met the whiny people? Here's the whiny family. <laughs> Here's a concept. Make your home a wine-free zone. I said a wine-free zone. <laughs> Easy. W H I N E. No whining allowed. I think it was Chris Ledoux, and we have a five dollar charge for whining that Tommy Joe sings. And we're going to charge you five bucks every time you come in and start whining. You see, God encourages us in those moments by saying to us what you're going through is happening with people all over the world right now and I'm with them the same way that I'm with you if you're whining you're going to miss that encouragement from the Father because you make it all about you and God says I'm there with you through it all. You don't have to want. You don't have to worry. You don't have to wonder where God is. And Peter says, don't be surprised by trials. It's not a matter of if you're going to suffer or grieve. It's when you suffer and grieve. Let me remind you of the words of Jesus these are some of his final words. And, and by the way, he was talking to his disciples. This was not spoken to a large crowd. When Jesus said in John 16, he was talking to a small group, to his buds, to his friends. He said, I've told you these things that in me you may have peace. In this world, in this temporary world, you will have trouble. But take heart, I have overcome the world. This is not hard for God, guys. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, as I've said before many times, are not in heaven right now going, wow, we never saw that coming. We didn't see that the economy was going to take a downturn like it did. Maybe we ought to have a meeting. Maybe we ought to pull the three of us together and kind of come up with some solutions. We got people down here, you know, praying to us, calling to us that something's wrong. What are we going to do? They're not up there wondering about any of that. They're not calling emergency meetings. They're not working through the weekend trying to come up with solutions. Now, God's going, listen, take a deep breath. I've already overcome the world. I said that before I left. It's all temporary. This is temporary. <laughs> Take a deep breath. Lift up your head. Lift up your head because I've overcome the world. Don't be surprised by trials. <laughs> Better yet, remember, Lord, I'm not the only one going through hard times. There are many in worse shape. Than me. And the reality is, is you don't have to look far to see the frailties of the human condition. Then he says in verse 7, let me tell you why you're going to suffer grief and all kinds of troubles. He says, so that your faith, he said, which is far more precious than gold, may be proved genuine. And Jan and I often say, Lord, thank you for faithful people that we get to hang out with. Thank you for the faithful people that walk alongside us, that walk alongside us together, that we walk along with. You know, this worship service may be unconventional. We're certainly not perfect. 
But I believe that we've been tested and our faith has been proven to be genuine. I can tell you that from a pure heart and a clear conscience. That's a fact. We're a little messy sometimes. <laughs> a couple of you still got that little stuff on the corner of your mouth <laughs> from the donuts. You might want to think you just teasing. <laughs> but our faith has been proven genuine. And listen, suffering and grief, they don't earn you salvation. That was paid for at the cross. Suffering and grief. What it does prove is whether or not your faith is really a genuine faith. It proves whether or not what you say is what you really believe. Will you walk it out when things are not Disney World? Where are you going, Teddy? I'm going to Disney World. Well, every day is not Disney World. Every day is not a good day. It proves something. It, it reveals something. And this is why now that as we look at the world around us, as we, whether the economy is ebbing or flowing, it, 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 where we look at our, our marriages, our families, it doesn't cause marriages to go bad, but it reveals the cracks that were already there. Or it reveals the strength that you have in your relationships. That's what suffering and grief does. It reveals something. It exposes something. It proves something. And it proves whether or not you're genuine in your faith. And it's not about genuinely, do you genuinely believe? Yeah, I genuinely believe. But am I genuine? A genuine faith to me is a life lived out, fed by, directed by the Word of God. So much of, of what we hear these days is, well, did God really say that? You know who was the first one to ask that question? It was Satan. It was the serpent in the Garden of Eden who questioned Eve about eating the, the fruit. Because the reality is that God never wanted us to live for eternity with the knowledge of good and evil. And He says, on the day that you eat that fruit, you will surely die. And that meant that you were going to begin to die. You died spiritually because it separated us from God, the relationship that Adam and Eve had with God in the garden. And it separated us physically because now we're going to die. Because i got to tell you the truth. I don't want to live for eternity with the knowledge of good and evil. I've had all about I can stand. <laughs> all i got to do is watch the news. i got the big picture on good and evil. I want to spend eternity with Christ. I want to spend eternity in heaven. Verse 8, he says, it filled with, it filled with, filled them with <coughs> an inexpressible and glorious joy. About 200 AD, there was a guy named Dionysius, Dionysius, <laughs> these Greek names, Dionysius, and he wrote a letter to some friends of his, and some people believe that this guy was uh, the guy that was mentioned in Acts chapter 17 that Paul led to the Lord, it was a guy named Dionysius, he writes a letter to one of his friends, and listen to what he says, he's, he's a very young man, and he writes this letter. He says, I have decided today to become a Christ follower. I found those people to be very peculiar. I watch them as they are persecuted. 
I watched them as they suffered, but they are filled with this. And he quotes this passage. He says, they are filled with this inexpressible joy. And I've decided I want to be part of them. This guy gives his heart to the Lord because he was hanging around persecuted Christ followers who had this wellspring of joy that would not go away. Can I tell you something? How, how great an opportunity we have right now in this world. What great opportunity we have right in this community. We don't have to be fake or plastic. We don't have to have just a happy smile on our face. Hi. I'm fine. You see, people see through that really quick. And so if you got a really cheesy, churchy smile, lose it. <laughs> Drop it. Because what people are fascinated by is this joy that cannot be taken away. It doesn't matter what we walk to. Yes, we mourn. We may grieve. We may be sad. But at the core of who we are as Christ followers, we should be a people that radiate this inexpressible joy at every time. And that doesn't mean go, I am just so happy I, I you know, I'm broke. <laughs> I'm so happy that you know, I lost a loved one. I'm so happy. It's, it's not that. It's that inside of our heart, inside of this inner being, there is a, a, a strength, a, a joy that cannot be taken from us. It's great to be around very positive people. It's intoxicating to be around someone like that. When I find somebody like that, I don't want to leave. I want to hang out with them. I want to be around them. On the contrary, I don't like being around critical, negative people. Bums me out. How often do, do you get up and just say, well, you know, I just need to find somebody that's really crit critically and critical and negative today. That's how I want to spend my day. I just haven't had my fill yet. I need a little more criticism and a little more negative input to make my day. Well, if you ever wonder why you don't have any friends, stop being negative. Stop being critical. Stop fussing. You know, there are just some people who gripe if they were eating ice cream. But we've got a substantial joy, and it's real and it's authentic. It's a genuine faith, and I see it show up every week. It's so cool. That's why we call this Jesus in jeans. It's not because you can just wear jeans, which you can. I don't care if you come in flip-flop, shorts, pajamas. I don't care. Just come. But we're not expecting anything other than God showing up. It's not the clothes you wear, it's the commitment of your heart. And when your heart's committed to the Lord, He's going to show up. Because the Holy Spirit fills this place. That's His job. And it shows up in each one of you. And it's great to be part of. The fourth step, Paul would say, live your life applying the instructions. The other, in the middle of this chapter, Peter finally comes around to laying out some instructions for all of us to apply to our daily lives. And the important part I want you to grasp is that he's, he's, the word is instructions rather than rules. Because applying instructions creates an environment to grow. Creates an environment to growth. The rules... If you're just about following the rules, that creates an environment for control and legalism. And that's not what God is about. 
Jesus spoke more to the Pharisees and to the religious leaders of his day than he did ever to a sinner that came and said, Lord, I'm a sinner. Help me. You're the guy I want to talk to. Let's go do lunch. I'm hungry. You hungry? Let's go to your house. That's what Jesus did. And so he gives us these instructions that says, if you will live by these instructions, you're going to have a better life. You're going to walk closely with me. He says, with minds that are alert and fully sober, set your hope on the grace to come, to be brought to you when Jesus Christ is revealed at His coming. He says, as obedient children... Do not conform to the evil desires that you had when you lived in ignorance. So we've got to be alert and sober and we've got to act as obedient children. That's not always an easy thing to do. But that's what Peter is saying is be alert and be sober. Be, act like obedient children. Don't conform to the evil desires that you had when you lived in ignorance. But just as He who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. For it is written, be holy because I am holy. Now I've, I've told you all before that that verse does not mean be perfect because God is perfect. Because God is perfect. The word holy is to say be set apart. Be set apart because I'm set apart. I'm not in here you know, living a life that is apart from God. And that's what Jesus, He came, He was fully man and fully God, but He did not sin. He didn't get caught up in the ways of the world. And that's what God is saying. He's saying, be it holy because I am holy. Be set apart from the rest of the world because I'm set apart from the rest of the world. doesn't mean being odd for God. It means be set apart. Be who you are in Christ. Does that make sense? Because we get that twisted up sometimes. We, you know, we, we think that being holy or being you know, righteous is being self-righteous. That I can look at you and go, well, well you need to be, and what, you'd be better if you did it this way. And Thank you for sharing. <laughs> the last one is to live your life by deeply loving. By loving deeply. Verse 22 says, Now that you have purified yourself by obeying, obeying the truth, so that you have sincere love for each other, love one another deeply from the heart. Now, again, the heart is not the muscle that beats in your chest. It's from your inner being. It's from who you are in the spiritual level. That you love one another deeply from deep within yourself, your being. Peter goes on to say, For you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and enduring Word of God. Who is the living and enduring Word of God? Jesus. John 1. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was God. And it appeared before us in the flesh in the person of Jesus Christ. For all people are like grass. And all their glory is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers, the flowers fall. But the Word of the Lord endures forever. And this is the Word that was preached to you. Peter says, I don't care what you've accomplished. It may look good for a while. It may be pretty as flowers. But it's going to pass away. It's going to fade away. And you see, the enemy wants each one of us to focus on a few little problems and ignore the vast ocean of miracles that are happening all around us. It's not that you're supposed to put your head in the sand and ignore the problems. Just don't give it so much bandwidth in your life. 
one of the main ways that I've found for me that I can get my focus back, that I can build on a genuine faith and a glorious love is through worship. And by the way, everything is worship. It's not just music and songs. Everything in our life is worship. Everything points to God. All of our lives are worship. I can tell you that what you focus upon is who you will become. What we focus our attention upon will eventually form who we are on the inside. <clears throat> There's a saying that I learned a long time ago from one of my mentors that says, whatever has your heart has you. Whatever has your inner being has you. So what gets you to that point of being focused? I think for all of us, it should be developing a genuine faith and a glorious love. <clears throat> We're probably going to end today on the internet. And I want to say everybody that, you know, continue to to pray for us, continue to get in touch with us. We have a, an email up there. Jesus in jeans, all one word. Jesus, the letter in jeans at gmail.com. Let us hear from you. I want us to end with a little singing, a little praise and worship. I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene and wonder how he could love me a sinner condemned unclean how marvelous oh how wonderful and my song shall ever be. How marvelous, oh how wonderful is my Savior's love for me. He took my sins and my sorrows, He made them His very own. He bore the burden to Calvary and suffered and died alone. Oh, how marvelous, oh, how wonderful, and my song shall never be. Savior's love for me. When with the ransom and glory His face I at last shall see T'will be my joy through the ages to sing of His love for me. Shall ever be how marvelous, oh, how wonderful is my Savior's love for me. How marvelous, oh, how wonderful, and my song shall ever be. How marvelous, oh, how wonderful is my Savior's love for me. Jesus, strong, he close, close Lord, to you. Let the world around me fade away. 
Jesus, draw me close, closer, Lord, to you, for I desire to worship and obey. Jesus, draw me close. to worship and obey for I desire for I desire to worship and obey my Jesus my Savior Lord there is none you. All of my days, I want to praise the wonders of your mighty love. My comfort, my shelter, tower of refuge and strength, let every breath Never cease to worship you. Shout to the Lord, all the earth, let us sing. Power and majesty, praise to the King. Mountains bow down and the seas will roar at the sound of your I say, Lord, there is none like you. All of my days, I want to praise the wonders of your mighty love. My comfort, my shelter, tower of refuge and strength. All that I have never cease to worship you. Shout to the Lord, all the earth, let us sing. Power and majesty, praise to the King. The mountains bow down and the seas will roar. At the sound of your name, I sing for joy at the work of your hand. Forever I love you, forever I stand. Nothing compares to the promise I have. Oh, nothing compares to the promise I have. Oh, nothing compares to the promise I have in you. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art. How great. Thou art. Then 
sings my soul, my Savior God, to Thee. thank you for your promise your promise of love your promise of grace your promise of mercy and all of that father you've tied into an inheritance that will never spoil will never perish will never fade Father, help us to live our lives in the ways that we've discussed. Never let us lose our sense of wonder. Help us to live like heaven really is our home. Help us, Father, in, in every single way to not live by rules, but to be guided by the instructions of your word because Father it is the manual for our lives and Father help us to love deeply because you love us the world needs your love we need to live out of that love so we say always, Father, help us to be a witness every day for the gospel and <clears throat> use words if we have to. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for empowering us. Thank you for your word that guides and directs our lives every day. We love you, Lord. Thank you for loving us. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn His face toward you and give you peace. And all God's children said, Amen. Amen. Thank you all for coming. <laughs>